Welcome back to the original Gangsters podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato here in my home studio. Uh, welcome everyone here with my colleague and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey now. Hey now. <laughs> and um, we have Benny in the house as well. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, please subscribe to our podcast on, on YouTube. And um, we're going to start getting back to dr dropping more audio episodes as well. Please follow us on social media, Instagram, trying to get more active on these platforms, bring you more content. So thanks again, everyone, for following along, following along. Um, I think we have a fun case study to look at today. Um, Eddie Nash. And uh, this guy was a major crime lord in Los Angeles. And there's been movies made about this dude, or at least, you know, that have had him as part of the movie. Um, fascinating case study, crime boss, sex trafficking, drug lord, murder, racketeer. And um, let's get into it. Bernie, what do you how do you want to uh, Just, start us off? Um uh just to be clear with people that this is going to be another in our series of uh, life and crimes. Oh, good. Yes. Where uh, we're going to kind of nothing that's, you know, relevant to this second, but we're going to go and kind of do a, you know, a 45 minute to uh, to an hour deep dive on some iconic crime Lords that maybe, you know, a little bit more than meets the eye or a little bit, you know, more than people or, stuff that we think people would want to know that they maybe don't know a ton about it. So if you saw the movie Boogie Nights, um, if you saw the movie Wonderland uh, with pretty big actors, you know, Boogie Nights had Mark Wahlberg. Um, and John and, C. Riley, Burt right. Reynolds in there. Wonderland uh, starred Val Kilmer. And um, they both, in various depictions, uh, chronicled what Eddie Nash became world famous for. That's not the whole story of Eddie Nash, but just to give people that kind of jumping off point, uh, he was the alleged uh, main conspirator in what became known as the Wonderland Murders. Uh, it's actually the anniversary of it's like today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the um, 40. Three and 43 year anniversary of the Wonderland murders, first week of July. Uh, I believe it was July 2nd, 1990, or sorry, July 2nd, 1981, um, when the uh, Wonderland murders took place at the Wonderland, um, off of Wonderland Street in Laurel Canyon, where the Wonderland drug gang was headquartered. They were the main suppliers of cocaine to the main Los Angeles area, uh, area uh, from around 77, 78 until the murders took place in 81. And according to the government, never proved in court, but there was an, at least two trials, I believe. Uh, Eddie Nash had been robbed by the Wonderland gang, on, I believe on June 29th. And uh, the the murders were retaliation, and so that's how I think the the public if that knows about Eddie Nash, that's what you probably know about. Him. Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty gruesome murder, and we'll get to that when we get to the chronology here. But so we'll back up here and um, to the beginning. Sure. He's born in um, he's a Palestinian, and. My understanding is that he he had he was born into like a, a prominent middle class to affluent family, but they weren't um, Muslim. They weren't Muslim. I don't think so. No, they I were Christian. So. They were Christian. Yeah, and um, but they are the family. My understanding is they're they're pushed out when there was you know settlements, Israeli settlements, and so he leaves that environment. It's getting like you know politically tumultuous. And so he leaves basically with like five bucks in his like I think like literally it was just like a few. I think they said he. I think they said he landed in L.A. with seven dollars in his. Yeah, right, right. He literally just had a few bucks, and he heads for the United States to to start, um, you know, a new life. And he's very successful as a legitimate business person. He um he starts off as a um uh, selling like hot dogs. 
No, he started off selling. He started <laughs> off with a hot dog stand uh, on, um, I believe it was on Hollywood Boulevard. I, I could be wrong. <laughs> right, yeah. Or the Sunset Strip, one of the iconic drags. Um, and then he parlays this hot dog stand into like owning seven restaurants and five major nightclubs, discos, uh, concert venues, and was really at the epicenter of the L.A. music scene uh, in the 70s and 80s and was, dare I say, integral in getting groups like Van Halen and, and, and Aerosmith uh, launched. Yeah, some of those California bands, yeah, those are where you think of like the the Sunset Strip and some of those bands uh were were gaining attention in in that scene and then eventually became national. Well, then then what what I why I mentioned Van Halen and yeah, Aerosmith Aerosmith was, I, they were on run a little bit earlier, but I, I think it's more Van Halen cuz Aerosmith well, was no, an East Coast band, but No, no, no. I could be wrong. You can check yeah. this. I'm yeah. pretty sure Aerosmith was the house band at Starwood. Oh, could be, yeah. And when you're the house band, that means that you're playing there every night. And Starwood yeah. was owned by by Eddie Nash. Yeah. Uh, again, I could be wrong. You can double check that. But yeah. I'm pretty sure he had more to do with Aerosmith's career than Van Halen's career, even though you are right. Aerosmith was a Boston band and uh, Van Halen was an L.A. band. Right. So you think it was the other way around. Yeah, and and Aerosmith. I mean, their first record came out in seventy two, I think. But I, yeah. I, I, whatever. Some people can fact check this on that. But so yeah, so Eddie Nash, he, he's a hustler, and um, he was also doing work as a stuntman. He was like in he was like in, a, in an episode of a pretty uh, popular television show, right? But the, but Cis, think, the it was called the it was a television show called The Cisco Kid. Oh yeah, yeah, right. And he he, he appeared in an episode in nineteen fifty two. I was going to um, say that that's old. Yeah, that that goes back. Wow, that's an old. Yeah, so that's show. early television. Um, and he appeared in a in a uh, in this television show, The Cisco Kid, as a cowboy named Nash. His real yeah, name was uh, Nazarat. Uh, what's, how do you pronounce his real name? I'm looking here. Uh, it's uh, Adele Nazarala. Nazarala. And he turned that into Eddie Nash. And and the the Hollywood thing is is important because that's where he starts meeting you know people who are movers and shakers around town and he starts to become you know a well-known figure he starts partying with these people and they 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 start going to his restaurants and his nightclubs and so it really becomes a scene in the man in his mansion yeah was a, was a scene like with criminals strippers porn stars hollywood actors and actresses musicians all kind of it was open from what I can understand. It was, you know, 24 seven party. Um, and there were a lot of famous faces that, that uh, would, would show up there as well as the, the Wonderland crew. I'm not, I'm not trying to jump ahead of ourselves, but yeah, like no, ahead, these, yeah. these were both kind of criminal entities in Los Angeles in the seventies and eighties that were dovetailing with, with celebrity culture. No, for sure. And what's also interesting is around the same time, he is um, becoming a cokehead, right? Like a lot of other people like, were. Major, but, like free, free, <laughs> and free basing. Right. And his, uh, in, as a matter of fact, he basically like destroyed his nose, like his septum. He like, he, like disintegrated. Um, but, but the reason why I bring that up is, is his behavior started to become more erratic. And he decides that, it's not enough to just um, use cocaine. It's not enough to just sleep with porn stars and hookers. He 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 starts to, to get involved in, in organized Com criminal activity. He becomes a racket boss. I mean, I right, would say. Right, right. And I, I definitely think you could argue this. I'm not saying it's definitive. But I think you could make an argument that in the in the early 80s, when he did kind of shoot to more national infamy or because of the wonderland murders i think you could say he was the most powerful crime boss in southern california and i and i say that knowing that the dragna crime family the la mafia was still a functioning entity at that point but i would probably say eddie nash had more juice and power than than Pete Milano or uh, Dominic Brooklier 
at, at that exact same time. I think so. Definitely by the, by the eighties. Yeah. So he becomes a, 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 essentially a crime boss as Scott points out. So he starts pushing a lot of weight, but also involved in, in sex trafficking, but also, um, I mean, check off the boxes of traditional uh, rackets also like, um, extortion to the extent of allegations of arson, like burning down like rival, rival strip clubs and, and, um, I believe restaurants. Mm -hmm. So, um, this guy is, um, not just like a, a party animal who's, who's friends with all sorts of different people. Um, he, he's heavily involved in the underworld and, and a significant underworld figure in addition to being no, a, a well-known club owner. Again, please correct us in the comments. If, uh, I'm inaccurate with this for people that might be more versed on Southern LA crime history or not even crime history, Southern LA culture. Um, sorry, not Southern LA, Southern California uh, culture. I believe his Odyssey, his disco was called the Odyssey. I don't know if it was the first disco in LA, but it definitely was like a, an equivalent of like a Studio 54. Uh, in in Los Angeles, where it was like the the disco to go to when disco was a big deal. So it was yeah. the the two big places he owned were. I mean, he owned several others, but the Odyssey, which was the disco, and then the Starwood, which was the uh, concert venue or not or you know rock club. Yeah, and I don't think that he was. Maybe it was the you know this the especially in the seventies the disco era. Um, I don't think he was trying to shield from the fact that he was a crime boss. Like it no. wasn't like, Oh, I'm just a disco tech owner. I'm just a hot dog stand owner. <laughs> I, I, I think, I think people knew. Around yeah, and I think he was, the, he was, the, he was a, a, a boss. Yeah. I think there was an allure to it. And I mean, I can, uh, I've, I, I'm a big rock bio guy. Um, and I remember reading, I think I read two separate, uh, Aerosmith bios back to back. I think I read Joe Perry's and Steve Tyler's back to back. And they both talked about Eddie Nash in there about how he helped their careers, making them the, um, uh, the house band at, at Starwood. And they both said that like he was a gangster <laughs> yeah. and they, and they, they used it as a juxtaposition, not even, that would be the wrong way to say juxtaposition, but they, they use it as like, Hey, this was stuff that we were used to. Because where we came from in Boston, we were dealing with the same type of characters. Yeah, and also there's um, uh, some, um, you know, people um, are less likely to take advantage of you if you have an affiliation with. I mean, that's what um, you know Led yeah. Zeppelin did with their manager, and he he wasn't a gangster, just to be just to clarify. He just was, but he was a but he was a tough dude, strong arm. <laughs> Managing. Yes, right, right. That's a good way to put it. Right, yeah. Full contact managing. <laughs> yeah, so they didn't, you didn't take advantage of of them, you know, promoters, record labels. So it it's it doesn't hurt to have an affiliation with someone like with someone like Eddie Nash. Um, but yeah, so he's um, um, sex trafficking, dope dealing. Um, I think he was moving uh, stolen jewelry as well, fencing yeah. stuff. Out That's of his right. mansion as well as out of the club, um, he was taking just you know just like any racket boss would. I know he was taking pieces of anybody that was moving drugs uh, in his in his clubs. I'm sure they were being supplied by him anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he was doing his own. I think what I'm saying is he was doing his own wholesale trafficking, and then he was profiting off of the people in his employment at his restaurants and clubs. Uh, taking pieces of their retail drug. Yeah. Drug. And, and this whole scene, you have rock stars, you have people from mainstream Hollywood, but you also have X rated film stars fully integrated in this universe, this like <laughs> discotheque uh, and, and well, these nightclubs, you know? So it, it's an, it's a very colorful environment. Well, I think it was the first time, that time period was the first time that like pornography was becoming somewhat mainstream. I mean, not to the level of mainstream it is now, but <laughs> it was kind of coming out of the shadows at that point. 
Yeah. Um, and like you said, like the people that were the marquee names back then, you didn't have there was, this was before VHS. This was before DVDs. You had to go to a theater. To yeah, watch, and they would put and just like with yeah, you know, just like with uh, movie stars. So when you say marquee, like literally, uh, yeah, their names were on the marquee, theater. right? Um, the and, red, whatever the red light district where the porn where the uh, X rated theaters were. And these guys were all partying, uh, partying with Eddie Nash, including the, you know, this is a you can get him. Uh, you can, you know, it's his way to sag. I mean, right. That's where I'm going. John, John Holmes was a staple, uh, at, um, at, at Eddie Nash's house and, and, and at the, and we should say, and at the Wonderland. House. Yes. Yeah. But he was, he was, he was good friends with Eddie Nash. Right. I mean, it wasn't like just casual acquaintances. They were hanging out. He was lot. like a party. He was like a party favor, like a, not a party favor. He was like a, a parlor trick the court jester kind well he because at this point john holmes was at the end of his porn career he couldn't really perform anymore because <laughs> he was so drugged out right he was coked there right um and people should know also at this point everything was not fully legal like full like shooting porn back then was illegal like in some situations was illegal mm-hmm. like yeah not decency like decency laws, yeah, right, like these, decency laws and things like that, right? So there was like a a, a heat factor, like in terms of law enforcement. It, it was still, that's a good want. point. I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's a good point to mention. Like, it makes sense this overlap because it it was a very kind of under it was a grimy underworld kind of industry for, just by its very nature. I don't think right? you could shoot porn without being without fear of being arrested until the early '90s or late '80s, and and so. And we know that, like, for example, LCN was heavily involved. Oh, it in controlled. X-rated it was industry. regulated. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it it makes sense that a guy like Eddie Nash <laughs> would be uh, interacting with, with people from that from that world. And then a lot of these, even now, I'm sure, a lot of these uh, performers in, in, uh, in the sex industry are um, addicts. And there's a lot of crossover between social drug use and drug use on sets um so it's not crazy that these would be people that were uh hanging out with guys like eddie nash and and the wonderland crew and then this another layer of it i know that the lanius group i'm not positive about eddie nash but i know that the wonderland group we're, we're supplying a lot of the um, studio, uh, television studios and movie studios and yeah, Laurel Canyon. I mean, that's that's yeah. known as I mean, they're that's known the as birthplace like of what well, was the birthplace of like the whole folk rock mellow music, the Eagles and mm-hmm. uh, all those type of groups that that came out. Uh, Jackson Brown. Mm-hmm. It all came out in the early seventies from that California sound. Yeah. California soft rock, I guess. Yacht Steely rock. Dan. I don't know. Right. Steely Dan yeah. Fit in there. Like but yeah, that. but Laurel Canyon, it's known that there are studios there. Right. That, that's a it's Hollywood, you know. And um so John Holmes is um a rather notorious character, not only as a as a as a well known X rated film star, but um he's he's he has a uh, a very expensive cocaine habit. So he is um, being frequenting so- both, frequenting both the parties at the Eddie Nash mansion and the parties on Wonderland Avenue and Laurel, Laurel, Laurel Canyon at the Wonderland headquarters, which was like a two story um, it's apartment, a condo it? apartment where there was a, a main master bedroom on both the first floor and the second floor. And the um, he owes the the wonderland gang a lot of money yeah so i also want to point out and this is kind of just crystallizing in my head right now we made that comment about eddie nash being you know as powerful if not more powerful than the italian mafia i would say that in 1981 the summer of 1981 where all this popped off and again i say this with all due respect to dominic dominic brooklier who was the la mafia don at that time I think Ron Lanius, who was the 
boss of the Wonderland gang and Eddie Nash were probably the two most powerful, dangerous mob figures in Southern California at that time. And this couple days between the end of June and early July 1981 uh, brought them uh, into loggerheads. You know, they, 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 the uh, locked horns. And at the yeah. end of the day, one of them, along with three other associates, were, were brutally, heinously executed. But I think they, um, but they knew each other, and they were uh, up yeah. until that point. They were, I think, they worked together sometimes. Well, they, I think they, uh, <laughs> they would use each other as layoff. You know, if they needed, yeah, yeah. Uh, they were both the two. They were the two biggest wholesalers in the area. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they definitely knew knew who, who each other were yeah. and had some kind of association. And so, with each other. so uh, Holmes was like I, like I said before, it was kind of a parlor trick where that he was hanging out all strung out and he would hang out with Nash and he would hang out with the Wonderland guys. And in both those situations, they would use him to entertain guests at the house. Like Johnny, take out your dick, show everybody yeah. your 13 inch. He was dick. known for being well and done. <laughs> but, but I'm saying it, it, it was like, I, I, it's almost like, I mean, it was just when you're embarrassed for somebody, <laughs> like that's pretty humiliating. Like that's what it's come down to for you to get your cocaine. You have yeah. to run around as like a lap dog to these drug dealers and then get humiliated by them to entertain the people. Oh, he's a, he's a house. pretty at that point in his life. He's a pretty pathetic figure. Yeah. John Holmes. Is. There's no no question about that. I and mean, he's a junkie um, to your point. He's a, CI, about, he's a CI. He's a CI. Yeah, he he's he's a pretty pathetic figure at that point. In his life, I mean, I'm, that's. I, I think that that's important, though. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, th- that not a lot of people know that he was a, a confidential informant for uh, FBI and LAPD. And and um, to the point of him being pathetic and also being desperate, um, he has a ferocious cocaine habit, and he is uh, specifically with the Wonderland crew. He is unable to pay them what he owes, but he has a he has a card to play. He thinks he does at least, which is he's also friends with Eddie Nash. He knows that Eddie Nash has a lot of jewelry and cash in his uh, home. And uh, he tells the Wonderland crew to pay off my debt. Basically, we're going to use Eddie Nash as the mark. And we'll I'll I'll help you rob him. And uh, the Wonderland crew, this is also something I find. This is more of a juxtaposition. The Wonderland crew were moving 50 percent, 60, 70 percent, however much of the of the blow uh, wholesale wise going through that area. They weren't big cokeheads. They yeah. were they were H. They were heroin addicts. Mm-hmm. I mean, these were guys that needed. Like I, a drug dealer once told me this, I think it was Johnny Curry. So sh- uh, shout out to little man. But it was one of the more profound. Uh, statement someone made to me from from that side of it, saying, "Scott, cocaine, marijuana, those are party drugs. Heroin's an appointment drug, hmm. right? Like you need it every day, or you're going to be sick." Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there, I think there was some some role in that mentality played a part in all this. Well, and I think also, like I don't know, if, you know you want to get into this, like the kind of social status, but like, you know, Eddie Nash was a popular crime boss. The Wonderland crew had a reputation as being kind of low life, low, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Like they were, yeah, they, 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 they were had a lot of juice, but they were, but they, right. They were considered pretty rough around the edges. They came from, you know. or at least uh, Ronnie Lanius came from Sacramento. Uh, he was a, a bad boy up in Northern California, big arrest record. Um, Had been a, Vietnam vet. I believe, I don't want to conflate here, but I know that he was kicked out of the Marines because he was moving heroin back in body bags. I don't know if he was doing this with Frank Lucas. Oh, yeah, right. That's what comes to mind right away. Um, but this is, you know, this is somebody that was very entrepreneurial uh, from, you know, before he took over the Coke game. In, in um in LA and uh 
he was known as a sociopath. I mean, everybody uh, that all law enforcement that worked him before he got to L.A., uh, you know, said this guy is a is a one man crime wave. Yeah. And so he didn't have the same kind of cachet like he was not like the popular man about town like like Eddie Nash was. No, but but the Wonderland apartment comp or a condo was a huge party house yeah where celebrities would show up and just score drugs and hang out they maybe not they maybe weren't necessarily hanging out with ronnie lanius right uh the way that they were hanging out with eddie nash uh lanius had a right hand man named billy Deverell, who was the good cop to lanius's bad cop um and was known as a laid-back dude who was even-headed uh, and, and that could be rational when Lanius was was going off the deep end. Um, but again, he had a, a big heroin habit as well. So you had a lot of different substances that were clouding or uh, uh, influencing judgment here. And the, you know, then we'll go we'll go to what happened. But this was what what Holmes told them to do, or or said, hey, clear, I'll clear my debt if I help you set these guys up. This wasn't a one-off. Holmes knew that part of the rackets that the Wonderland crew did were drug rip-offs, stick-up mm -hmm. jobs, home invasion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were fencing stuff too, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, he gets them into the, into the mansion. And so Eddie... And Eddie Nash is, yeah, it's June 29th. 20, it's the, the night of the 28th going into the 29th. And did, he, did they know Eddie Nash? Did they know Eddie was going to be there? I don't remember. Did they know he was going to be there? I think it's it was one of those things that you you never know what was fact versus fiction, mythology mm -hmm. versus real life. I mean, I, I, I know that in in one of the movies, I believe, it's it's the uh, it's the belief from the Wonderland crew that they were going to be going into that house and Nash wasn't going to be there. Right. Yeah, that, but I don't, I don't know, know if that, that I, don't, I don't know if that's actually remember. true or not. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Either way, true. you're robbing Eddie. Either whether he's there or not, you're still robbing Eddie Nash. Yeah, it's pretty so, risky. So Holmes leaves. I think it was about three or four in the morning on the twenty as the twenty eighth turned into the twenty ninth. Uh, and left the sliding glass door uh, from the patio open. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the Wonderland guys with, I, I don't think Holmes was there. The Wonderland guys, uh, three or four of them, bust into, uh, into Nash's mansion at like five, six in the morning. Right. And and Nash's bodyguard is there, I think, right? Right, Greg Dials, who was a big black guy. That uh, again, if you saw the movie, if you see the movie uh, Wonderland, he's portrayed by Faison Love, um, who's one of my favorite uh, actors. He's really he's he's a funny guy, but he's also a, a good serious actor. And then um, they have in the movie Boogie Nights. It's not like exactly what happened in Wonderland. It's the scene where him. Uh, it's they're all Mark Wahlberg's characters all strung out and they go over to this guy's house and the guy who's supposed to be the Eddie Nash character is played by Alfred Molina. Mm -hmm. Um, and they try to rob him. They kind of like, you know, took a couple of different real yeah, life was in, things. It was and put inspired it in. by it, but not right. a literal, uh... but in both of these scenarios that were fictionalized, the Eddie Nash has this fat black bodyguard right that's right. watching his bet but they get the jump on him the wonderland right. crew get the jump on every, on both of on both of them and they put um, him they put him um face down and uh tie him up and pistol whip him um steal whatever they can get their hands on i guess they were doing his coke in front of him uh as they were doing it as they were you know, uh, rip, ripping the stuff off. They stole over a million dollars. Yeah, and they shot. At, I don't know. If they some, someone said it was an accident. Other people say it wasn't. Uh, and they shot Dials. Mm -hmm. Right. They they just grazed him. It didn't end up uh, going inside him. But uh, again, this was this was a big fuck you um, 
to Eddie Nash and very, very quickly, like within hours, Eddie Nash knew exactly what had happened. Yeah, and I would say I would say this before we get into the actually what happened is just in terms of like analysis of that world is if you're going to do that to Eddie Nash, you better kill him. Right. Am I right? Am I I'm not yes. I'm not saying like to be <laughs> obviously I'm not endorsing that from a moral position, but in that world, if you're going to do that to him, you, you better kill him. Yeah, because he's, <laughs> you know, he, he uh, he's going to figure wrath, out who he, he's going to figure out who did it. His and, wrath was was pretty right. severe. Right. And like I said, this these were not just retribution murders. I mean, people get killed for revenge all the time. And again, that's not good or OK. Right. Or right. right. But there's killing somebody and then there's butchering poor people. Well, Eddie, Na- Eddie Nash wanted a, a statement to be made of like, this is what happens when you fuck with when you fuck and with you and th- women. You think you could get away with this? Yeah. And women. We're not just going to kill you, but we're going to kill your loved ones as well. Who had nothing to yeah, do wh- with Whoever's in the house. Right. Whoever's in the yeah. whoever's in the, the, the condo or apartment, whatever it was. Um, so Di- so allegedly Dial's, I believe Dial's brother and a couple other guys. I think there was four. Um. And Holmes. Well, they go to Holmes to the because Eddie suspects it was the it's one Holmes, but within from, a couple hours. Yeah, no, I, he he suspects it's one of them, but I think he's told within a couple hours. Hey, John Holmes did set you up. Yeah, and so he's go, he's out running around with your jewelry. Right. So they go to Holmes and they corner him, and they right. and they you know they want confirmation they, of what they pretty much already know, and they want him to do the same thing. That he did for the Wonderland guys for him. Get right. us or in. they're gonna kill him. Or they're right. gonna kill him. Right. Get us into the Wonderland house so we can uh right. seek retribution. So, so so Holmes is only like free pass here. It's like because we're otherwise we're just gonna kill you too. Is mm-hmm. get us access and then you know, maybe we can <laughs> figure out a way to settle this with you without killing you. But um so Holmes in a lot of ways didn't have a you know, he, again, he's sort of a pathetic you know, figure and and there's still he's, que- he's and there's trying still, to stay alive. And there's still questions to this day, like what actual involvement he had. I believe he was there. I believe he participated, but that still has never been proven. Yeah. Um, he was acquitted of it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's been other people that have said that yes, he helped them, but was not present. He did not take part in the the uh, the the be- they were all beat to death, like bludgeoned to death. Right, right. I, I mean, I think there's no question he was there. I mean, he, yeah. whether he participated, I mean, but we'll get to like the evident, the forensic evidence that that he was there. But so Holmes is like basically okay, fine, I will help you so you don't kill me, and um, then uh, walk us through um, the. So then the Nash night of crew gets to the Wonderland. Um, it complex. was early, mo- early morning, July second. They bust in i think some of them were sleeping um and they the some of them were already like they i think they killed the people that were alive and then they went and and just started beating on people that were already or that were sleeping and couldn't defend themselves yeah um the i know there was some forensics evidence forensic evidence that made it appear that um and there were there were four people five people attacked four people died three were women three women were attacked two of the women died the only survivor was ron lanius's wife and she almost died i mean they beat the fuck out of her yeah um one of another woman that was killed her boyfriend had allegedly left there were still some questions about what he did know and what he didn't know. He was a wannabe biker from Sacramento that was buddies with Lanius um, from Northern California and, and did some prison time with him and was just uh, visiting for the weekend when all this stuff happened. Yeah, there, there was, there's, um, I've heard rumors that Nash and the Wonderland both had connections to outlaw bikers, which I'm assuming Ventura well, we know- County. I'm, I'm assuming it was Hell's Angels. Well, we know that in the years after wonderland there was a murder of eddie nash's uh girlfriend 
and her son, who could have been Eddie Nash's son, um, by a Hell's Angel named Robert Garceau, I believe. And it's still, again, in one of these questions or one of these situations where we don't know exactly what, if any, role Eddie Nash played in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that connects him directly to the Hell's Angel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So they they um they think they, you know, like you said, there's one survivor, but the, the point is to to kill everyone in there. And um Billy De- it's, so it's Lanius, Billy Deverell, who's his right hand man, second in charge, Deverell's wife, Joy, who's the owner on paper of the condo, and then David Lynn's girlfriend, um the biker from Sacramento that that came down uh, to hang out with Lanius that weekend, who was with Lanius and the Wonderland guys when they busted into Nash's house. But I guess that night that that Nash's guys came to to um, get revenge, according to Lynn, he had left to score drugs um, somewhere else and was at a motel. There's some I think there's still questions if that if that's if that was true. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was gone. But his his girlfriend, who didn't know these people uh, until you know a day or two before that, when she traveled with him from Sacramento, so she wasn't even really in the Wonderland. Right, it was collateral. Jo- jo- Joy uh, Miller, I think, was her name, would have been considered a Wonderland gang member because it was Billy Deverell's wife. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this woman, um, again, I'm blanking on her name. I think they called her Butterfly. Uh, but but she was murdered in it and she really had nothing to do with it so in in terms of um you know this isn't traditional gangland execution where they just shoot some you know shoot everybody um they they beat them to death with like pipes right bats and pipes it's pretty gruesome because um for that to happen right this is going on it's not like a you know it's not like boom 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 walk out (laughs) And uh, not that 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 isn't gruesome either in its own way, but you know what I'm saying. Like it this was is, a slaughter. Was this a slaughter. is a slaughter, right? This this goes on for for several minutes. Um, L A L A P D made a comment that there had not been a bloodier crime scene since the Manson killings. Yeah, helter skelter, right? Yeah. yeah, that's what they that's what they compared. That's to. how much blood there was uh, on you know on the scene. Right. So it, it's pretty gruesome. Um, so let's talk about like the follow up in terms of uh, how they suspect that that nash and holmes are are involved in it i think it it fell apart pretty quickly right i mean i don't think it was day i believe david lind and holmes were both talking to government were, were both informants at some degree before this yeah so you already holmes had the trial pretty it's i mean holmes is, yeah it's not 82 when he's right you know so it, you're so right what i'm saying is you already quick. had what I'm saying is in, in this orbit with all these characters in this drama, you already had at least two of them that were CIs. Yeah. So it didn't, I don't think it made it that difficult to to solve. Yeah. To, to connect the dots. So we also know that um, Holmes had a bloody palm print above, at, a be- above the bed. Yeah. At the, at Wonderland. So I think, I mean, I think the evidence is pretty clear. He was there. Um, and it was above, Lon- it was above Lanius's corpse. I mean, and well, Lanius was the one that used to embarrass him. Right. Like would, would, you know, would uh, leverage the, the dope debt. And so I think the, the argument from the prosecutor was, although this wasn't his idea and although he's not a violent person, he was brought to the scene, was forced to get his, his hands dirty and when he finally unleashed on Lanius, he let all that emotion go because of the anger he had towards Lon. Yeah. And he was and so Holmes is, is put on trial and he's acquitted. What do you think? I mean, I'm not that familiar with the with the case. Do you have any any knowledge of like, I, I, what, what happened there? I watched the E truly the E true Hollywood story on it. Right. That's probably the extent of my knowledge. Um, I just know that whether it was Nash, whether it was uh, Holmes, whether it was Greg Dials, they kept on bringing people to trial for this, and, and they could never get anything to stick. 
Right. They did but, get they did get Eddie Nash for for racketeering and drug dealing and. Well, they got so they get, around the same time they get Nash on cocaine trafficking. Right. But he but he bribes the judge. Eddie Nash right. bribes the judge. Well, and so in, in the he gets in, an early he gets an early release. I believe that Eddie Nash, when he was put on trial both times, I think he went on trial twice. And in both times, either from confidential informants or from wiretaps, they were they were able to find out that bribes were paid in both situations. So Nash, if everything's I'm not talking about the Holmes trial. I'm talking about when Nash went on trial for it. If if everything's being if everything's even, I'm thinking Nash gets convicted. Yeah. Oh yeah. So so Nash has his own trial and he gets a he gets a hung jury. Yeah. But in this case, like he he bribed the judge on the Coke thing. In this case, he bribes the he bribes a jury member. Right. Who was like the only a, yeah. You get a hung jury. Right. Um and and so law enforcement has a hard on for Eddie Nash because he's he keeps seems to be getting away with all of this. Let me back um, up one second, Jimmy. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, ahead, I've given people the wrong date. So it was Ju- it was June thirtieth into July one, not July one into July two. So it happened on the twenty ninth, and then there was a day of rest, if you will, um, and then the next day is when the Wonderland murder, or I should say, the Nash invade, the Nash home invasion took place on the twenty ninth, and then forty eight forty eight hours later, not seventy two, um, the Wonderland murders. And a thing that I think is is really you know to talk about that's fascinating about this case study is so you gets he gets the hung jury he gets released early on the coke charges and after that he's pretty much scot free for a long time i mean i remember so you he, and he I, continues he continues his run <laughs> for another I mean, I like, when, almost when, two decades i remember when we first met jimmy um and we were kind of sharing our interests and stuff and i i can remember talking this about you and i'd be like yeah. Is he dead? And he wasn't dead at that point. Right, he was. <laughs> and um it's like like you said, he was kind of able to quietly go into the night. Uh, maybe his last uh ten years or fifteen years where he really was um left alone. I'm I'm guessing that he didn't uh just, you know, start going to church <laughs> and, right. and become uh you know found religion. No, I mean my understanding is he continued to be a drug trafficker and, and involved in sex trafficking. Um and so, um, I know in, um, I mean, he got indicted in, after the new, I mean, he got indicted after the, in, in the new century, he got indicted right, in 2000, 2000, right. On, on a yeah. Rico case yeah. and they raided his house and they thought they were going to find cash and Coke and, and they didn't find they didn't. anything. They yep. didn't find anything. And so, um, they get him a, a Rico case They get him on 16 counts, uh, drug trafficking, you know, racketeering, um, the, um, he pleads out to a lesser charge of jury tampering and um, he gets a four year sentence. So just think about that. The, the guy who, who in all likelihood orchestrated the Wonderland murders um, ultimately gets a a four year sentence and he only ends up doing a a year. Year. Yeah. (laughs) He only ends up doing a year. He was probably Uh, a CI. I mean, let's not, (laughs) (laughs) but it, it seems pretty remarkable. You know, I mean, that was one luck. of the that was one of the things I took away from some of the books I read. And not to you know rehash this. I know we talked about it uh, twenty minutes ago or so, but Holmes was playing both sides of all of this. I mean, every I mean, he was playing everything against the middle. Yeah, the Wonderland guys, law enforcement, both LAPD and FBI and DA. I think he was an informant for all three of them, and Eddie Nash. So I mean, this was a this was a a dangerous a game. Yeah, a lot yeah. of duplicity going on. Yeah, and and by the way, we'll we'll, we'll come back to Eddie Nash uh, to, to wrap his story up. But John Holmes continues to be a pathetic figure. So he yeah. he gets acquitted of this, but uh, he continues to be a drug addict. I think he starts making like really low end pornography, and I guess. I guess that sort of sounds weird. If you if you, if you don't like pornography, you might think, well, isn't it all low end? Well, mm-hmm. I, I guess it depends. <laughs> it depends I mean, this guy mean was a, <laughs> and this is before Jimmy and I's time, but just again, just based on my research and talking to people that were around back then, this this guy was in that world. 
literally and figuratively, this guy was the biggest there was. Yeah. And and, and he was yeah. making a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, he but, snorted it all. He snorted it all away. Smoked it all away. Right. But by, by the end, um, I think he was so desperate for drug money that I think he was I think he was working for less okay. toward the end. Well, and he was and he was uh, I don't want to say gay for maybe gay for pay. And, yeah, my, and I'm not saying that as a <laughs> I'm not trying to uh, be anti LGBTQ or no, no. he was making he, he was making gay pornography. Yeah. And that, he, was he was prostituting doing. himself uh, that's right. to, to men. Yeah. Right. Right. So And um, so he was, um, again, at this like pathetic figure and he ends up um, dying from he gets HIV and ends up dying from and a lot of, with AIDS a lot of what you AIDS. saw. Or a lot of what happened to Holmes was dramatized in boogie nights if not yes. the wonderland murders you see the the dirk diggler character um who's i'm blanking on the name of the he create he created like his own within the character of dirk diggler he creates his own like on-screen persona i'm blanking on what is brock landers i think it was yeah Bro his brock landers character was in reality inspired from John Holmes's Johnny Wad character, <laughs> which they was reference a, in the movie, <laughs> right? Which is which is a, who was a who was a detective? <laughs> I mean, in these like really bad, you know, porn <laughs> screenplays, right? So if, I'm just I'm just saying if if you don't yeah. remember John Holmes, but you can remember Boogie Nights, I mean that character was was like ninety percent taken from Holmes, and at the end of that. Uh, movie he's totally strung out and he's prostituting himself to men yeah and getting I mean, beat we, up and getting beat up for it when you when you think of like um linda lovelace i mean some of those like iconic x-rated film stars of the 70s uh he's 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 in there with you know th those those big names for sure um so he he's he, you know he he's um you know pretty much um you know it's very like tragic you know case study i mean you know he's a drug addict and whatever but um he's he iconic though i mean he really was like at the end of his at the end of his life i don't want to overstate this but i really think he was very and in, in certain slices of americana he was iconic and representative of an era an area and a space in time um oh in his heyday in the 70s he was yeah a big, i mean in that world he was the big right. he was he was one of the biggest names on the um uh, and and uh you know people in hollywood wanted to hang out with them because yeah. you know but, that, but, what, but what i said earlier in the show and i and i'm not i'm sorry if i belabor points sometimes but um this was the first time that that was being accepted you didn't see in the 50s and 60s you didn't see actors and musicians hanging out with Back then, they were called stag movies. Right, right. You no, there was no crossover. It wasn't until the seventies and eighties where it became kind of cool and accepted to like. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the um, the seventies, you know, with the counterculture after the sixties, uh, people were it, people were less uptight. Playboy and Penthouse and Hustler. Right. You know, yes, those right, were, right, right, right. That that was happening around the same time as the counterculture. And so part of that's the free love, you know, kind of thing. And so that's a that's a really good cultural observation. I think by the 70s, uh, especially I mean, I think sort of like mainstream Midwest America still like thought it was smutty and sleazy. But like in, in Hollywood, yeah, there wasn't this kind of stigma of like, oh, I, I can't hang out with a stag film. Right. Like those lines started to not really. Yeah, yes. they, would, they, would, they would blur. <laughs> right. I would love to be on an aside. I would love to do one of these at some point this year when we're doing these kind of LCN adjacent or or even non LCN crime stories. It, Hugh Hefner in the 1970s was the number one target of the DEA and the FBI in Chicago. And they went after the Playboy Empire with a full court press. Um, from 1970 to 1975, it's a fascinating story that ended, that ended up with the uh, alleged suicide of his personal secretary, who uh, might have been on the verge of turning on him. Um, 
I, I, I would love to tell that story at one point and just let everyone know that the Playboy that we know almost wasn't. It almost came all cramp crumble. It almost never made it to the point where there was an L.A. Uh, Playboy mansion. Mm -hmm. The reason that Hugh Hefner went to L.A. and bought the L.A. Playboy mansion. There was too much heat. <laughs> was There was too much heat in Chicago with the original <laughs> Chicago mansion. Right. Um, and there were DEA agents all over the place. Um, and, and a lot of it was, a, I think a lot of it was a witch hunt, but I do think there were some kernels of, I don't think the belief of the, and again, I know I'm on the side and I'll, I'll show up in a second, but the belief from the DEA and the FBI was that Hugh Hefner was running a racketeering enterprise through Playboy, mm -hmm. through prostitution and drugs. I don't believe that was the case. I don't think that, so. But that was the premise of that. Yeah investigate so i i think he was being targeted because he was this radical counterculture figure who like offended i think a lot of sensibilities you know just another example of uh those worlds kind of colliding and um luckily for hugh hefner he didn't have the fallout that the uh you know that, that john holmes and that whole world in la that sex world all kind of imploded. no and and and, and uh, i guess if you you know if you really want to like deconstruct the, this kind of adult entertainment kind of world playboy always had the sort of when i talk about higher end low, when i was saying yeah. john holmes was doing these lower end like they were the playboy classy the they were the classy end. publication right right that was considered more higher end like all class pornography right um so in terms of eddie nash back to this about him getting this kind of remarkable preferable treatment he go he gets sentenced to four years he does a year he gets out on um for health reasons, but um, a, a lot of research lives suspect another, that it wasn't it, it was wasn't true. He lived another twelve years or thirteen years, <laughs> right? That it, somehow again he was pulling string, and, um, that he really he really didn't have health issues, and he dies a free man. He's eighty five years old. Um, yep. has has a long run, and uh, he has some skirmishes with law enforcement, but for the most part, he skates. Um, for the for the most part, you know, I would say I would say I would say, I would say wrapping it up and like looking back on it and and kind of trying to encapsulate what his legacy is or what his he's one of those people that maybe the masses don't know about him the way that people know about um you know the big Meeches or the sure. the Carlo Gambinos or the whatever. Yeah. But if you, it's like one of those things, like if you knew, you knew. Yeah. And he's going to be remembered in that regard, in those circles forever. And he's just, in those circles, he's just as infamous as the Al Capones and the John Gotti's and the Suprema Griffs and the Big Meeches. Yeah, he's a, he's a big name, uh, was a big deal, especially in, the, in that environment. And so, um, you know, shout us out on social media if you have ideas about other episodes on um you know life and crimes um you know some people we hope to get to at some point um we uh have talked about supreme doing an episode on him uh maybe pistol pete another black oc nikki nikki figure. barnes i'd like to maybe nikki dive barnes. into nikki barnes um we uh might, we might do one on jack toko to do some lcn um alex rudai maybe Al yeah the albanian uh, uh crime boss in new york so um, if you have ideas, um, maybe uh, we, we have some ideas about some outlaw bikers. So if you have any ideas, shout us out. Let us know. Uh, we, we, you know, we'd like to hear it and we'll consider recording um, uh, more more episodes uh, for you all. So I like this. Um, it's fun. I like. Yeah, it. this was fun. Thanks, everyone, for watching and listening. Please and I would subscribe. Follow us on social media. What do you got? Bernie? Uh, last thing I'll say is, you know, I think most I'm guessing if people that are watching this that are pop culture, you know, nerds like us i'm guessing you've seen boogie nights wonderland is maybe a movie you haven't seen um and i think wonderland is very underrated and i think val kilmer even it's a hard movie to watch granted it's gruesome it's gr yeah but i think val kilmer is one of i think it's one of val kilmer's best acting performances um and i really like the way that the movie was shot and mm -hmm. um the story was told Lisa Kudrow, it's a cool film. Lisa Kudrow uh, is in it from Friends, who plays a serious role, which I thought she was actually very good in it. Played his, um, played his wife. Mm -hmm. um, and then an actor named Eric Bogosian plays Eddie Nash. 
Yeah. But I would, that's, not, that's, so, that's what I would leave it with. I would recommend, I think a movie's from 02, maybe 02, 03. Um, I would recommend checking it out. Yeah, it's good. I agree. It's a good film. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, guys. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Scott Bernstein. We're out. Oh.